And this flashed through my head as I got out. It, I had thought about it before they had cautioned me. He said, you're going to be on live radio and live TV. And I, uh, I honestly couldn't think of what I really should say. And the solution became very obvious to me as I stepped out. I said, they don't want me to talk to them from up here. They want to hear what we're doing up here while we're actually going through the mission. So what you heard were two test pilots conducting their mission uh, in the best manner possible. Yeah, let's look at the film now. I think this is a good time. I don't know exactly what pieces they have of it, but as we go along, I'll try to look at it and try to share with you a few of the uh, moments that I had out there. Here it is right here. Oh, no, they've got one right here in front. This is actually, it looks like the egress. This is actually when I'm coming out. What I had tried to do was actually fly, to actually fly with the gun or maneuver with the gun right out of the spacecraft. And when I departed the spacecraft this time, there was no push off whatsoever from the spacecraft. The gun actually provided the impulse for me to leave the spacecraft. The first time I tried to come out, there I go, all right, now I'm, I'm leaving and it's under the influence of the gun. I'm trying to maneuver over to my left so I would be in front of Jim's window. I maneuvered approximately down the center line of the spacecraft, perhaps favoring just a little on the right. But the gun is actually providing the impulse for my maneuvers. I've started now a yaw around to the left with the gun. At this time, I knew, that I knew we had something with the gun because it was actually providing me an opportunity to, to control myself where I wanted to go out there. The uh, control was actually what we were trying to demonstrate on our EVA operation. We, uh, we knew a little bit about the tether dynamics, but we wanted to actually find out how well could a man outside a spacecraft with a maneuvering unit control himself and in later parts, we wanted to find out just how well could the man control himself uh, with a tether also. It looks like uh, right now I've started to float up, and uh, this is the influence of the tether. It always tried to drift me up above the spacecraft, away from the area that I wanted to be in. Oh, I see right now we're not getting the full framing on the screen, so it's difficult to... I think at this time I was translating back toward the spacecraft. I came back toward the spacecraft, up over the hatch, turned around above the spacecraft, out of the view of the cameras, and uh, this time I told Jim I was coming back again uh, out in front of the spacecraft to see if we couldn't be sure that we could record it on the cameras. I should, I, if I recall this right, if this is the section that I uh, recall, I should come in from the right, the left side. There it is, I see it. I'm coming in now, and I went out in front of the spacecraft at this time and actually made a yaw either direction. I found that the control with the gun to the right and to the left was what I felt quite adequate, and the pitch was quite adequate. I only had six feet per second in the gun, which is a very limited amount of air, so I tried to use it very sparingly. I just used it enough to satisfy myself and to make maneuvers so that I felt in my own mind that I could control myself in both pitch, yaw, and translation. This is the type of control that you need to move from point A to point B in space. If you can control your pitch and your yaw and translate fore and aft, you can actually go from point A to B uh, roll really doesn't, isn't very important. The roll didn't bother me. I wasn't trying to control myself and roll because it's like our re-entry. We don't really care about the roll as long as the pointing, directions, pointing direction is uh, accurate. On this one, I used the tether to come back into the spacecraft. You can see my arms right now actually moving the tether back and forth and it doesn't provide a great deal of control. This was the first time I realized that we'd mounted the tether in a position that wasn't optimum to operate in the area that I had wanted to. It continually put me above the spacecraft, uh, perpendicular to the, per actually perpendicular to the surface from which the tether was attached. If you visualize the slope of this TV camera here and the 
pointing direction is the direction I'd like to operate in. The tether being attached at this point always tended to pivot me. I'd go out this way, and then it would pivot me right back in the area that I didn't want to be in, which was back around the adapter section of the spacecraft. Right now, I'm actually uh, working with the tether only. I'm not working with the gun. It ran out after my first, uh, my actually second translation out in front of the spacecraft and back. And this was the time I had made the statement, I sure wish I had a little bit more uh, fuel for my gun. Why don't you talk about the stuff on the adapter that you saw? It was pretty interesting, though. I, I didn't mind getting back on the adapter uh, section. I was able to actually take a look at the thruster areas. The plumes of the thrusters, as Jim was firing them to stabilize the spacecraft, looked just the way uh, uh, Mr. Chamberlain told me they would. Look, they came out about a foot and a half or two feet from the spacecraft and uh, didn't look very ominous at all. This area, the foot and a half to two feet, was an area in which the heat they felt the heat would damage my suit. I was right above them, about five or six feet above them, watching them fire at one time. Uh, this was a time when I got right out by the nose and looked down at the nose. We'd uh, thought that I might get out there and, and actually see if I could hold on to the nose and Jim translate the spacecraft. But I got out there, took one look at the stub antenna, which was our connection with radio back to the Earth, and I felt this wasn't any place to play around with. And so I didn't do any work around the nose of the spacecraft. I pushed off and went on out uh, further. When you push off the spacecraft with a tether, uh, it's very difficult to push off exactly in the direction you want to go unless the surface of the spacecraft is perpendicular. So you see, when I pushed off, it put a nice big rolling uh, motion to me, and I'm using the tether now to pull myself back in to the spacecraft. The tether was uh, quite, quite useful. I was able to go right back where I started every time, but I wasn't able to maneuver to uh, specific point with it. Right, maybe he's walking on top of the spacecraft. Right, I will. Uh, another use that, tether that Jim uh, mentioned to me was I actually used it to pull myself down on the spacecraft, and at one time I called down and said I'm actually walking across the top of the spacecraft, and this is exactly what I was doing. I took the tether, pulled myself down on the spacecraft to give my Self a little friction on the top of the spacecraft and walked about three or four steps until the angle of the tether to the spacecraft got so much that uh, my feet went out from under me. But I was able to actually walk right up the walk right up the spacecraft. Now let me describe a little bit. Uh, one of the first things they asked us, of course, when I got back in and we reported down to uh, the mission director that that we experienced while I was outside. I experienced no disorientation whatsoever. And I'll explain to you a little bit of the method that we used as far as orientation was concerned. We felt we had a stabilized spacecraft, and one of the things that Jim was doing inside the spacecraft was uh, maintaining the spacecraft in a fixed attitude for me. So I always could work off of a stabilized base. This is the way we started out. And uh, when I got out, there was no disorientation whatsoever. I was able to look down to the ground, back to the spacecraft, if I wanted to at the sun, there really wasn't any reason to look at the sun, and I didn't do that very often. But the stabilized spacecraft was a fine reference for me. And as we went on, uh, Jim uh, called me out and said he was going to let the spacecraft drift a little more. This was when I was pushing off of it and putting uh, rotational velocities into the spacecraft. And at this time, even with a spacecraft that was actually rotating, it still gives you a three-dimensional object on which to orientate yourself, and uh, for me this was plenty adequate. I was able to use the spacecraft, use the ground, and uh, this provided me adequate uh, orientation cues. There was no disorientation associated with EPA. And you don't uh, feel that a second object is uh, required uh, to take a fix on, like the sun or a star or anything like that? No, I didn't. The, and we would felt this ahead of time. We talked this over thoroughly with, with uh, our mission planning people and had decided that the one object which is three-dimensional itself, was adequate for orientation, and it was. Well, I think, no, I, I didn't feel like I was skipping, but uh, Jim, I think, could hear me clunking along on the top of it. I didn't feel like I was walking uh, right here on Earth because uh, I was actually providing the attachment to the spacecraft with the uh, tether. It was a little bit associated with the, I'd done a little work like this before. I'd walked on the ceiling of the 135 aircraft at 
at Wright Pat. We tried walking with Velcro aids. Uh, the one thing that I was kind of looking at, well, could you actually use Velcro to, as an aid of attachment to the spacecraft and permit you to walk? And uh, I didn't feel a, really a firm attachment. I felt the attachment that was being provided by the tether, which it was. The method of closing it was for me to hold on to a canvas strap and to use a large lever and ratchet the hatch down. But when it got back in, and the, I found out that the lever was actually turning free and it wasn't actually ratcheting the hatches down. And so we'd had this problem demonstrated to us before and we knew what, what the trouble was. It was one of the little levers that have to be set so that the gears are set and will actually take up as you pull on the handle. I had to actually act as a little spring in there. I had to go back with my right hand, operate the lever, reach forward and operate the big handle and I had one more buddy with me, and he had to actually operate with me on the bar and the lanyard to p apply the force to close the hatch. So I think if we had one period in this flight where teamwork really paid off, I think uh, more so than any other time, this was the time it did. Because as I pointed out, I actuated one lever with my left hand, the other with my right hand, and Jim pulled like the devil on the handle. And between the two of us, we got into the proper sequence that we knew we had to get into to close the hatch, and uh, this is the manner in which we close the hatch. Just to show you how training pays off, uh, Jim and Ed had actually completely disassembled that hatch and put it together themselves prior to the flight, so they really knew what the mechanism was. And this didn't come. This didn't come as a bolt out of the blue to us. We were familiar with this mode of failure. We had a method of operation so that uh, if this did occur, we knew what to do about it, and this is exactly what we did do. I'm not going to say that my pulse didn't go up when that handle turned freely because <laughs> I'm already convicted. Chuck already has the data here on the ground, and, and he's told me it uh, went up a tad. But uh, you know, I, might add, I might add a little bit right here. This is one of the reasons that it takes so long to prepare for one of these flights. Uh, we, you just can't cover every eventuality like this rather insignificant thing. At least it was insignificant before flight. You really can't train for all these things and cover all of them unless you do it hard and long. I'd like to make a few comments on, on the EVA work that are a little more in line with what we were looking for. As I mentioned earlier, we were looking to find out, could man control himself in space? And the answer is yes, man can control himself in space. Uh, he needs a little more fuel than was provided to me. We also were trying to find out what were the dynamics of a tether? We found out the, a great deal, I believe, about the dynamics on the tether. The movie showed us a lot. I can tell you a lot about it. I also realized right away that our tether was mounted so that it put me exactly where Chris Kraft had told me to stay out of. He told me to stay away from the adapter end and also the thruster firings. And the last thing I'd like to say that the view from up there is something that's ex just spectacular. The one that I remember the most is as we came over Florida, I looked down, I could see the whole state of, the lower state of Florida, the whole island chain of Cuba and uh, Puerto Rico and the complete, complete chain of islands all the way down in, in one look. It was actually my last look because that was about the time that I got the word from the flight director to start in and this is the time that I started to come back in. The uh, conversation that you heard between Jim and I coming back in was as I was disassembling the camera. I had certain things that I had put up. It took me about five minutes to get them all put up when I went out. It took me uh, probably a little shorter period of time to disassemble the camera, to get the umbilical free of the door, and to come back in. Uh, the food that we had along on that flight, I know we have reputations of being big eaters, but the thing that I was very apparent to me that after about four or five hours if I didn't take a meal I felt a little bit uh, like I was slowing down a little bit and it was to me it was more pronounced than when I get hungry here I I tend to get hungry quite often here but up there when I